The aim was to build an aircraft that could carry troops and tanks over the Atlantic, where German U-boats were wreaking havoc on the Allied convoys. And the man contracted by the US Department of Defense to design and build this mighty aircraft was also a larger-than-life figure. Pilot, plane maker, film producer, perfectionist, Hughes was a man who thought big but paid attention to the smallest detail. This habit caused delays from the start. Though the contract was signed in November of 1942, it was 44 before construction got underway. By then, the U-boat threat had been beaten and the plane was no longer needed. Probably the most remarkable thing about it was that it was one of the largest airplanes ever built of wood, completely of wood. The only uh, metal in that was metal fittings and uh, things like uh, engine mounts and engines and that sort of thing. And of course, uh, hydraulic system, the controls and the tubing. But basically the whole structure was wood and uh, beautifully done, just beautiful cabinet work in it. Hugh's constant changes of mind and interference slowed down work on the aircraft. Washington finally had had enough and cancelled the project. But a vigorous lobbying campaign by Hughes won a concession, the government's agreement that one aeroplane could be completed. Two years later, the sections of the flying boat were ready to be moved to their assembly site at Long Beach. Well, at the beginning of the move, the moving crew were the most efficient crew I had ever seen. They didn't seem to have to talk to each other. They Each one knew exactly what he had to do. They obviously were going very slowly, and the streets were just lined with people. So as they went down the roads, they had to, first of all, clear traffic, and secondly, take down telephone wires and then put them right back up. All during this time, there were just no hitches. The crew knew exactly what to do. It's just perfection. And when they got the thing onto the site, I don't think they even put a scratch on it. It was just fantastic. It was built large because Howard didn't like to build anything normal. It had to be the biggest or the smallest or the fastest or the slowest. We started as a target to fly a 50-ton tank. Well, that has to be pretty good size. He was a perfectionist, but he couldn't uh, make up his mind. He wanted to keep hassling around until he got the absolute best. He sat in the cockpit for hours and hours and hours, moving his little parts around to get the instrument panel just the way he wanted it. But as a man, I enjoyed working with him very much. The continuing delays caused rumblings in Washington. The construction had swallowed vast sums of public money. Hughes was summoned to a Senate committee investigating the project. Its chairman, Senator Brewster, was on the warpath. You do solemnly swear in the matter now pending before this committee. But in front of the film cameras, Howard Hughes was in fighting form. Senator, may I ask a question? Well, now, if you'll just wait, Till I issue a subpoena for Mr. Mars, I've asked you whether or not you would produce him, and you said you didn't know, as I understand. I don't remember if that was my answer. Well, what was your answer? I don't remember. Get it off the record. Well, now, Mr. Hughes, I'm asking you what your answer was. And we're not going to have this bickering back and forth. You are before this committee, and you're going to answer the question. You asked me just now uh, about a reply that I made. My answer is I don't remember. Now, the man is well, taking down you again. Ask him. What? Will you bring Mr. Mars in at the 2 o'clock session? Uh, I, no, I don't think I will. Will you try to bring him in? Oh, I don't think I'll try. I've put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. On November the 1st, 1947, the giant flying boat was finally ready. Hughes prepared to take it out on taxiing trials. The aircraft was officially named the Hercules, but already it was known by everyone as the Spruce Goose. 
obviously flying crept in all of our minds because of the Senate investigation and the impact it would have. I was sitting in the co-pilot seat. We had, I think, four uh, newspaper reporters aboard. And, of course, the Hughes crew. There were about 40 people aboard when we started to taxi. And the first taxi run, Howard had us looking out the windows and uh, looking for logs and debris. And the only one who saw anything at all was Howard. <laughs> he had better eyes than we did. And that run was you know, about 35, 40 miles an hour. And everything seemed to be functioning well. After another faster run, Hughes prepared the crew for one more go. And then he kind of casually turned to me and he told me to put the flaps down to 15 degrees and uh, that's takeoff position. <laughs> surprise when it took off and uh, he recovered rapidly from the surprise and executed a beautiful landing but his first words when we hit the water was boy those flaps balloon this thing <laughs> I think Howard intended to lift it off a few feet just to prove that it would fly but I don't think he really intended to lift it off as high as he did I was alone with him we're riding back to LA and I said Howard did you mean to take that off today and he looked at me you'll never know <laughs> and i don't know to this day i don't think anybody else does the spruce goose never flew again but it remains to this day the biggest aircraft ever built the giant seaplane was never to fly again at hugh's insistence she was kept secluded and flight ready in a specially built climate controlled hangar. Shrouded in mystery, she remained entombed for 33 years at an annual cost of $1 million. Time caught up with both Hughes and the flying boat. After Hughes passed away in 1976, the hangar's lease expired and plans were made to disassemble the historic seaplane. Sumer Corporation Hughes Holding Company decided to divide her up, parting her out to the Smithsonian and eight other museums, and then destroying the rest. The Aero Club of Southern California, along with the Rather Corporation and aviation enthusiasts throughout the nation, stepped in to save her. On October 29, 1980, the flying boat emerged from seclusion and into the international spotlight. The world's largest floating crane, Herman the German, lifted her onto the dock of the temporary storage area. What was expected to take only a few hours took almost two days. In February 1982, a new site was ready. The flying boat was taken by barge down Long Beach Harbor, then gently eased into her new domed home adjacent to the Queen Mary. In the late 1980s, the Disney Corporation purchased the former holdings of the Rather Corporation. Disney discontinued the dome exhibit after two years. Now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I say clear, I state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived. The life that's true, I travel each and every highway, or oh, any more, much more than this, and did it my way. I guess I had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do.
my share of losing. And now, as tears of sight. 